I haven't got an alert yet, but I think we're supposed to be live, are we? So, good morning. Well, hello, buddy. I was wondering, usually, there it goes. My phone finally went off. Something went off anyway, telling me we're live. But there's buddy, so I know that we are. Uh, well, happy, happy Memorial Day to you, buddy, and everybody else that is on. That's what today is, Monday, the 25th of May, Memorial Day, a day of remembrance, which is something that we want to do when we come to our point uh, of opening as we get started. Morning, Sherry. Morning, Ruth. Well, as we get started, we had a fun day yesterday. Uh, we had uh, a couple of extra people in there, and that was neat, and... Uh, Everything seemed to have gone off pretty well. I had uh, one individual say they had a hard time hearing, so if anybody else had trouble, I would appreciate hearing that. I listened to it, and it sounded fine on my end when I watched it on uh, uh, after I got home. Uh, and later, after it was up on YouTube, we checked into it, and uh, it all sounded pretty good to us on our end. So if anybody else is having trouble, please let us know and we'll see if there's anything on our end or maybe it's on your end. Any rate, as we get started, uh, we're going to we're gonna pick up where we left off last Friday. The book of Hebrews tells us more about the, the deity and the priesthood of Jesus Christ than any other book in the Bible. The author has already demonstrated that Jesus is more, more than fulfills the messianic prediction uh, of, of being both uh, king and priest. His priesthood was appointed by God, and God had sworn an oath establishing Jesus in this priestly office, which is permanent and fulfilled by one who made uh, a single, all-sufficient sacrifice. The grand theme, remember, we come back to it just to keep it in front of us, the grand theme of Hebrews is that Jesus Christ is superior to prophets, to angels, Moses, to Aaron. Uh, his priesthood is superior to the Levitical priesthood because uh, his covenant is a better covenant, his sanctuary a better sanctuary, and his sacrifice a better sacrifice. So if that's the case, why would anyone ever want to return to the old law, to the old covenant? the old sacrificial system, when God has replaced everything with something that is far better. Uh, well, we understand that this church was under a tremendous amount of pressure, uh, both inside and outside. Uh, they weren't necessarily accepted by the Gentiles uh, completely and wholly, uh, and certainly they weren't uh, accepted by the Roman community, nor by their own Jewish uh, brethren. So they were caught. What do they do? Uh, do they go back? Do they do they tweak it? Do they make Jesus something less than what he is so that it is palatable to their circumstance? Well, when we begin to look at this, the answer is squarely, no, you stand because Jesus is far superior to anything else. Uh, the author of Hebrews now arrives at a central theme in all of this epistle. Hebrews chapter 7 begins the very heart of this doctrinal section of this profound letter. So, I'd like you all to put on your metaphorical waiters and, uh, and come with me. We're going to start walking out of some incredibly deep water in this letter. Let's pray. Father, we just uh, come to you with such gratitude. Uh, for the way that you have loved us, the way you have shown yourself strong and powerful in our behalf. We thank you for this day, Lord, and we don't want to be remiss in, in not remembering those who gave everything that we might have the freedom that we have and enjoy it to the full. Lord, we love you with all our heart. We thank you that down through the ages from the very beginnings of this nation, or there were men and women that were willing to put their life upon the line, not only to, to gain us the freedoms to begin with, all the way back to the Revolutionary War, 
But Lord, there have been those who have been willing to step, step in that gap and secure our freedoms because there always seems to be somebody out there who would love to take those freedoms away. Lord, we have been in many, many combats, many, many, many wars to determine whether this republic would stand or fall to tyranny. And Lord, I thank you for those heroes that we know their names and heroes that we do not know that all stood that we might enjoy the liberties given to us. Those unalienable rights, inalienable, Lord, that is guaranteed by our supreme sovereign. Thank you, Father. Bless now the rest of our, our study as we continue to walk through, through Hebrews. Open our minds, give us wisdom and understanding. Be our teacher, Holy Spirit. We just rely upon you for everything. Thank you. As we move forward, oh, hi, Carolyn. Glad to have you aboard. Hope you're doing well this morning. Uh, this is a topic that the author introduces earlier on. You remember in, in chapter 2, verse 17, he brings up the priesthood of Christ, and then again in three, uh, chapter 3 and verse 1, and, and moving on into chapter 4 in, in, in verse 14, and then he moves it right on. So he keeps dropping this little, this little priesthood bomb as he puts his letter together, almost like he's preparing them with each step, building, building upon the other, uh, making a greater statement, a, a more profound statement, until he gets to this section where he is really going to launch out. Uh, in, in chapter 5, uh, verses 6 and 10, uh, this is the longest singular uh, expositional passage running constantly, starting in verse 6 now. He's going to settle in there, uh, and, and uh, verse 6 Verse th chapter 6, verse 30, and it's going to be continual all the way through chapter 10. The author's teaching develops from and is based on Genesis 14, verses 17 through 20, and then again, uh, mentioned again a thousand years later uh, in Psalms 110, verse 4, uh, and then, of course, it's coming up now. Melchizedek's priesthood was superior to the Levitical priesthood of Aaron. Therefore, the priesthood of Jesus Christ, which is after this, this, this pattern, this fashion, is superior to the Old Covenant and the Old Priesthood. As we examine uh, this beautifully deep and profound passage, let's keep in mind, wherever there is light, there is going to be bugs and a lot of them. Hello, Marciella. And uh, Jesus is the only fulfillment of this scriptural type of Melchizedek. There are those who have latched on to the name Melchizedek and made it something that scripture does never do. Uh, they build a heretical teaching that have led many away from true faith in Jesus Christ. Some have even made it a priestly line with their own ancestral genealogy. But I would remind you, there is no such thing as a Melchizedek priesthood that is passed on from religious leader to religious leader within religious orders. Jesus Christ never ordained any individual to be a priest, in the order of Melchizedek. Peter, James, John never ordained anyone in that order. They weren't, they didn't. John the Baptist didn't ordain anyone to any priestly order. We need to limit our interpretation to the information provided in Scripture and be careful of ever reading into it anything that is not there. I think that should be self-explanatory, but at the same time, I think we need to constantly remind ourselves that we should not add to or make out of 
whole, whole cloth of you, anything that isn't there. Uh, let's not twist anything. Let's keep it the way it is. So let's take a moment and look at the uh, ancient background of Melchizedek. The author of Hebrews shows us that the law uh, proves that there is a greater priesthood than that of Aaron uh, and uh, under the Old Covenant, under the, the law. In Hebrews and chapter 7 and verses 1 through 3, uh, it says, uh, For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham as he was returning from the slaughter of the kings, and blessed him, to whom also Abraham apportioned a tenth of all the spoils, was first of all, by the translation of his name, king of righteousness, and then also king of Salem, which is the king of peace, without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, may, uh, but made like the Son of God, he remains a priest perpetually. Now, uh, I, I shared with you a couple of weeks ago, or a week or so ago, that you know there, there's a lot of thought that goes into exactly who Melchizedek is. Uh, is it a theophany? Is it an appearance of Christ? Is it Jesus prior to his incarnation? Uh, he's shown up in other places. Why not here? Well, we're not told. And uh, we're not told that Abraham worshipped. Melchizedek. Uh, every other place that we see there's a theophany, there, there's an element of worship. Now, there is the giving of a tithe, but that's a customary thing, uh, as we'll read even under the law. But whether it was a theophany or he was a individual, a, a man, uh, we'll leave that for eternity to answer for us. But the word Melchizedek is a proper name. It means a righteous king. He is the king of righteousness, the king of Salem. Salem is the old name, the ancient name for Jerusalem or the city of peace. Uh, we know Melchizedek was a priest because he blessed Abraham. And Abraham paid tithes to him of all that he had, had taken in spoil you know, during the war. And in Genesis 14, verses 18 through 20, here's the story. Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. I love that imagery. Now he was a priest of God Most High, El Elyon. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham of God Most High, of El Elyon, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God Most High, El Elyon, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And he, Abraham, gave him a tenth of all. Melchizedek is a priest of the Most High God. In other words, he worships the same God that Abraham worships. Most high is, is Elyon. And the, the, pro, the name that is given to God in this is revealed as El Elyon, uh, the God most high of heaven and earth. It's a description of the majesty, the power, the authority of God. He is the sovereign God. He is the one whom we worship. It's important for the author of Hebrews to stress that Jesus was a member of Melchizedek's order and not according to Aaron. Good morning, Sue. Um, remember what he said in the very last verse of chapter 6 that launches this entire section. Jesus has entered in, entered as a forerunner for us, entered into the veil, entered into the Holy of Holies where he sprinkled his blood Upon the mercy seat, Jesus entered in as a forerunner for us, anchoring, if you remember, you know, us to the Holy of Holies, to the throne of grace, having become a high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek is a type of Christ. There's many types in the Old Testament that we find uh, uh, shadows and figures and, and, and types of Christ keeping pointing us to the one that was yet to come. So he's a type of Christ in the sense that he is both a king and a priest. He is the king of righteousness over the uh, over the city of peace, if you will. He is the prince, uh, the peace priest of the Most High God. He is a type of Christ whose person and work fully achieves true righteousness and true peace. Christ is our righteousness. He is Jehovah Chidescu that we, we've already looked at 
on, I believe, on a Wednesday night, uh, revealed to us through Jeremiah in Jeremiah 23 and verse 6. He is also Christ our peace, Jehovah Shalom, revealed to us through Gideon in Gideon 6 and verse 24. All indication in Scripture are that he was a, a historic human being who was clearly uh, a, a type pointing us constantly to and finding fulfillment only in the person of Jesus Christ. By satisfying the righteousness of God as our divine substitute, Jesus Christ provides a, a perfect peace and, and righteousness with God for all who will believe in him. Romans 5, verse 1, Paul launches out and he tells us, therefore having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ reconciles all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of the cross. Ephesians 2, verse 14, tells us, for he himself is our peace, who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall. Melchizedek is the very first mention of a priest in the Bible. So look at the characteristics. Melchizedek appears out of nowhere. He is described in scriptures having uh, no genealogy. There's no account of his, his, his descent. Uh, he's on and then he's off the scene, never to be, to be spoken of again until 100 years later. A man with no beginning and no ending in his life. He is, as Hebrews 7 and verse 3 says, without father, without mother, without descent, descent, descent having neither beginning of days nor end of life. Melchizedek is simply appears in a moment in time and then vanishes from sight, never to be mentioned again. A hundred years later, David mentions him. A th or rather, a thousand years, a thousand years later, uh, the writer Hebrews picks this up and begins to unfold this mystery that has laid there for the centuries. The story of Melchizedek brings our great theological truths about our great high priest. It's all bound up in that. Remember, it's not the type that determines the antitype, but is the antitype that determines the type. Jesus is not portrayed after the pattern of Melchizedek. Rather, Melchizedek is made in the likeness, it says, of the Son of God. In other words, he fits the pattern of Jesus, not the other way around. The second part of this uh, third verse of chapter 7 says this. Uh, let's go, come on, click, click. Without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God, he remains a priest perpetually. Do you see it there? You see, that's one of those, those, those uh, uh, puddles that we step in that get a little deep. It's an interesting fact that the book of Hebrews is filled with genealogies, uh, whereas Melchizedek, in spite of his importance, has no record. He just simply appears, and then he vanishes. So he's described in Genesis as being without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days or end of life. And this is what makes him an excellent type of our ever-living, eternal Savior and High Priest. In the record of his life, Melchizedek is indeed an appropriate type of Christ as the eternal Son of God. As the King of Righteousness, he is exalted to the right hand of God the Father. And as our High Priest, he ever lives, abiding continually in the presence of God to make intercession for us. The type Melchizedek remains a priest continually for the duration of his appearance in Genesis. But his antitype remains a priest continually without condition, without limitations upon himself. The divine commentary on this great passage in Genesis makes it very clear that Jesus Christ is the great high priest of whom Melchizedek was a type. 
I emphasize this so that we don't slip into error in this area. Hebrews chapter 5 through, through 10 explains how the priesthood of Jesus is superior to Aaron's priesthood or any Levitical priest that comes along. The whole emphasis of Hebrews is on this better priest, a better covenant, a better sanctuary, a better sacrifice, and consequently, better promises. Jesus is acclaimed the perpetual high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Now, if Melchizedek is greater than Abraham, his priesthood must be greater than the priesthood that comes from the lineage of Abraham. You see the logic? You see where this is leading. Abraham recognized Melchizedek's uh, uh, superiority by giving him a tithe and receiving a blessing. Thus, the priesthood of Melchizedek enjoys higher status than the Levitical priesthood in Hebrews. Jesus is from the tribe of Judah, not Levi. He couldn't serve as a Levitical priest. Moreover, no Levite could ever be or serve as the Messianic king. The perpetual priesthood of the Messiah is confirmed by the divine oath that God gives. Take a look at, at verse 21, the last part of it, of the seventh verse. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. Thou art a priest forever. The order of Levi had many priests in number, well, because they would die. When they would die, they would have to be replaced. Verses 23 and 24. The former priests, on one hand, existed greater in greater number because they were prevented by death from continuing. But Jesus, there's your but Jesus, Carolyn. There's that but. Don't we love those buts? But Jesus, on the other hand, because he, con he continues forever, holds his priesthood permanently. You see, the Levitical priests, all theirs die. But Jesus lives forever. Therefore, that priesthood never passes on. Uh-oh, got a problem, don't we? If there, is a pass if there is a passing on, why is there a Levitical priesthood passed on when the great high priest, after the order of Melchizedek, never dies? And the priesthood only passes on when one is dead. Well, in his divine nature, the pre-existent Son of God was and remains eternal. How then is Melchizedek greater than Abraham and the priestly tribe of Levi? Well, take a look at the significance that we're going to find here in Melchizedek. No one is denying that Abraham was a great man, great man of God, as was many in his lineage that came after him. But uh, the writer of Hebrews lays out a case for the superior greatness of Jesus over Abraham. And when Jesus did that, remember they wanted to stone him, but you know, here's the writer. Now observe how great this man was to whom Abraham the patriarch gave a tenth of the choicest spoils. And those indeed of the sons of Levi who received the priest's office having a commandment uh, uh, commandment in the law to collect a tenth from the people, that is, from their brethren, although these were descendants from Abraham. But the one whose genealogy is not traced from them collected a tenth from Abraham and blessed the one who had the promises. But without any dispute, the lesser is blessed by the greater. In this case, mortal men receive tithes, but in that case, one, one receives them of whom it is witness that he lives on. And so to speak, through Abraham, even Levi, who received tithes and paid tithes, for he was still in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. Now, you know, that, that's a mouthful. I understand that's, that's a brain twister to get around, but let's take a look at it. Remember, the genealogy is really important to the Jewish people. The Levitical system made the priest's pedigree a great importance. All the priests had to be able to prove that they were descendants of the priestly family of Aaron, or they were excluded from the priesthood. Melchizedek stands out in this passage because he is not a Levi. 
In fact, the Levites are still hundreds of years away. It is true that the descendants of Abraham paid tithes to their priests. Is that not right? To the sons of Levi. But the emphasis is on how Abraham paid a tithe to Melchizedek. Melchizedek bestowed his blessing on Abraham. Abraham gives a tithe to Melchizedek. Abraham recognizes the superiority of Melchizedek's order by paying a tithe to him. The contrast is really between Aaron and the descendants of Abraham and Melchizedek. The principle to keep in mind here is, is greater is that the greater always blesses the lesser. Therefore, Melchizedek blesses Abraham and is therefore superior to Abraham. Melchizedek is greater, is the greater while Abraham is the lesser. Abraham experienced this blessing from God. And since Melchizedek is greater than Abraham, that makes him superior to Levi and to the Levitical priesthood. The, the timelessness of Melchizedek's priesthood resembles that of the Son of God. We've already laid that out. He abides a priest forever. He holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. The priesthood of Jesus Christ does not pass to another precisely because it is a perpetual priesthood based upon the eternity of Jesus Christ. Go back, take a look at verses 9 through 10. And so to speak, through Abraham, even Levi, who received tithes, paid tithes, for he was still in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. Keep in mind the culture during the time of the writing of Genesis. Back then, people regarded the descendants as in, as, as in, in one sense participating in the action of their ancestors. Levi paid tithes to Melchizedek. Now, Levi wasn't alive, not for hundreds of years yet. Even though he would not be born for a long time, he paid tithes. In fact, Isaac has not even been born yet. He was, so to speak, still in Abraham's loin. And, and when Abraham paid a tithe to Melchizedek, Isaac paid a tithe to Melchizedek. Joseph paid a tithe to Melchizedek. Levi paid a tithe to Melchizedek, as did all of the Levitical, Levitical priests to come after. In the, in the ancient way of thinking, Levi the head of the priestly tribe of Israel, had not been born, but he was involved in everything that Abraham did. It is the classic picture of what it means to be in, as in your life is hid with God, in Christ Jesus, in Adam all died, as in in Christ all have been made alive. Nowhere in the Bible, is there any evidence that Melchizedek conferred his priesthood on Abraham at, at when he paid his tithe uh, to him uh, or to any other person? And nowhere is there any biblical claim that Aaron's Aaronic priesthood was ever incorporated into the Melchizedek priesthood order. The author of Hebrews says in verse 24, very clearly this, Jesus, on the other hand, because he continues forever, holds his priesthood permanently. Jesus continues forever, so his priesthood is non-transferable. In fact, the word is uh, uh, a parabatos, and it literally means non-transferable. It carries a note of finality. This is the only place where this word is found in the New Testament. The priesthood of Melchizedek is the peculiar possession of Jesus Christ alone. It's non-transferable. It cannot be transferred to anyone. When the greater comes, the lesser gives way. The priesthood of Jesus Christ terminated the Levitical priesthood. The high priesthood of Jesus Christ resides in the Son of God, and there is no other priesthood or priestly order to come after it. He terminated all the rest of that with his perfect coming. 
The high priest of Jesus Christ resides in the Son of God, and there is no other priesthood or priestly order. We can, we can turn to our great high priest Jesus with full assurance and the security knowing that he is ever ready under all conditions to listen to our intercessions and pleading our case before the Father. There's a great truth attached to this. A wonderful reality for every believer. And that is that you and I have been made a kingdom of priests. That universal priesthood of all believers. Because Jesus is our great high priest. He has conferred upon, made us a kingdom of priests. Each believer in Jesus Christ can come to God in prayer. We can come to him directly in our own right. We can speak about the Lord to our fellow man. We are commissioned by God to present God to man and man to God. Isn't that incredible? This is our right. This is our privilege as Christians. Moreover, it's not limited to gender. Every believer Man, woman, every one of us are made priests unto our God. It's not some holy order. It is a holy privilege bestowed, open to all who come to Christ as Savior. Oh, Merciful and high King, gracious and loving Father, most holy high priest, we just come humbling ourselves before you in absolute awe of the work that you have done the grace that you have shown, the mercy that you have bestowed. Thank you. Thank you. Let our eyes see the depths and the broad breadth and the, the length and the height that this teaching goes. We cannot completely wrap our minds around it, but it's there. We see it. No place are you more exalted or lifted up to our eyes to behold than what we are seeing here. Oh Lord, may you be absolutely glorified in everything. Fill our lives with your glory, our homes, our churches, our communities, our families, our state, our nation. To you be all glory, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. That's some stuff. Well, I don't want to leave without practice today. You didn't think I would, did you? I'd like you to, to look at these verses. Go back and take a look at them. And see, especially in these verses that talk about how... Melchizedek, the greater, blessed Abraham, the lesser. And then I want you to consider how Jesus, the greater, what he did to bless us, the lesser, like yesterday when I spoke. And we'll look at it again this, this next week. To think that Jesus did not consider equality with God as something to be grasped, but looking out for our best interest, what was best for us. He left that lofty position. He put on the shelf and, and held in check his divinity and gave himself as that perfect sacrifice. So no other sacrifice would ever have to be made for our sins. Think about the greater and how he has blessed the lesser. And then reach out to somebody today. This is Memorial Day. Maybe you know somebody that, uh, that was in the military. 
and reach out and maybe just thank them for their service. You determine how best to honor those who so faithfully gave themselves for our freedom. Well, it looks like our time is just about up. I would share with you, uh, we still haven't heard whether the county is going to open up on June 1. We did have the blessing of uh, having a couple come in and join us, and uh, we're preparing uh, right now to move forward to kind of an official reopening uh, when we can, maybe looking in toward, uh, you know, in a couple of Sundays or so. So be much in prayer as we continue in that because there's some things that we're going to get done in order to be able to do that and uh you know so keep in prayer uh for all of us that are trying to get that put together and we are so anxious to see some of you that we haven't seen in a while talked to on the phone or visited this way but uh, uh we pray that uh, god will keep you and keep you safely and uh, if you need to get a hold of us and you have lost that information there it is right there hallbbc.org and uh, you can send me an email or whatever and it is uh, it, it is good what God is doing and the people that we've been able to reach out to these mornings have been garnering some uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 40 or so people uh, in the mornings and uh, to answer your questions some of you have asked uh, when we're back in service and stuff will we continue these and your responses have indicated to me that you'd like to keep these going so uh, I will do everything in my power to keep these going it's been a great time for me and I pray it's been a good time for you uh, I love you and I pray that you have a great day. Enjoy your day. Have a hot dog or something. I don't know what you do for Memorial Day, but uh, you know, make it a good day. May God bless you. You have a wonderful, wonderful day.